Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Caitlin and on this channel I upload all sorts of content relating to true crime, education and psychology related topics. So if that sounds like something you'd enjoy then please do hit that subscribe button and don't forget to turn on your notification bell so you are notified whenever I upload a new video. So today I'm back with another long case and this one is definitely one that I have not heard about. It is awful and it's so interesting to hear people's theories about it so as always please do leave your thoughts down below. I do just want to say very quickly before I start I do apologise if I mispronounce anything because this is a case that takes place in Japan and so because of that there's a lot of like place names and things that I probably will struggle to pronounce and I do apologise by that. But before we get started I'm just going to zoom through my usual disclaimer that I like to include at the start of all my videos just letting you guys know that I'm not claiming to be an expert in this case or any of the other cases that I cover over on my channel. I'm simply relaying the information I'm able to find myself through research of certain sources on the internet and because only certain sources are accessible to me it means I may get things wrong, leave things out or mispronounce things, I apologise if I do any of those things, I'm not trying to cause anyone any harm or an injustice, I'm simply working with the information that I have available to me. So with all that being said let's just go ahead and get started discussing the case of the Miyazawa family murders. This case takes place in the year of 2000 in the Setagaya region of Tokyo in Japan. The Miyazawa family had been considered a typical Japanese family at the time being made up of 44 year old Mikio Miyazawa, his 41 year old wife Yusuko and their two children Nina and Rei. Mikio worked full-time at a London-based marketing firm in just one of their many offices around many different countries and they dealt with many high-profile business clients like Microsoft. The company Interbrand had been an extremely well-established company at the time and all of Mikio's colleagues had stated that he was extremely friendly and he had this ability to get on with anyone that he had met. Mikio's wife Yasuko had spent her time as a teacher and seemed to make just as positive an impression on everyone that she knew. She was known to be a loving mother who spent much of her time caring for her children and her friends and colleagues all stated that she was an extremely kind person. Eight-year-old Nina was known to be a fun and playful young girl who enjoyed playing sports and ballet and six-year-old Ray was a seemingly normal young boy. He was known to have developed a speech impediment when he was very young and over the years his family had attempted to find professional help for his son in an attempt to help with his struggle but as of that time they were still finding some things difficult regarding this. Mikio and Yasuke had moved into their family home in Setagaya in 1990 as it had been an increasingly popular area for families to move into at the time. It was considered safe and secure for those families to raise their young children. Setagaya itself was the second largest district within Tokyo and was just a short distance from the main city and it was very different to the surrounding city-like areas and it was quite suburban and residential. The family home itself was an impressive building that was actually split into two separate spaces. Looking at it from the outside it would appear as though it was just one large house but it was actually split into two separate houses and this meant that the Miyazawa family had lived right next door to Yasuko's mother and her sister and brother-in-law. From the inside of the building there was no connection between the two properties but the seven of them had still been living in a relatively close space. There was a park located just behind the home which had been placed there quite some years before and, and there had allegedly been talks of this park being extended over the coming months. And because of this planned construction to extend the park, the vast majority of the residents in the houses surrounding the Miyazawa family's home had moved out or had been in the process of doing so. At the time of this case taking place, there had been only four families in the residential community, the Miyazawas, their family next door and two families living just down the street from them and because of this fact it remains an extremely quiet area. The main thing that the Miyazawa family would notice in their day-to-day -day lives would be just how busy the park behind their house would get as despite the plans for the expansion it was still open and particularly bustling. It's worth noting that the only thing that separated their property from this park had been a very small fence. In the week prior to their case taking place, the Miyazawa family had had a particular encounter with a group of teenagers who had been making rather a lot of noise at the park. It was known that Mikio had chosen to confront the group in an attempt to get them to quieten down and this confrontation had been witnessed by a number of witnesses who were passers-by. These witnesses had claimed that the group of teenagers he had spoken to had actually been a part of a group called the Boso Soku, which were a form of gang. 
It appeared as though this confrontation hadn't turned violent or particularly sour and this issue seemed to be left at that. Since the construction was planning on continuing around this area over the coming months, the Miyazawa family had been planning on moving away from the area but they wouldn't be doing so until the early months of the following year, meaning that they would be one of the last families in the area. In the lead up to New Year's of that year, there would be a number of strange things that occurred to the family. It was known that in the summer months of that year, the entire neighbourhood had been disturbed by the realisation that there were a number of local animals being kidnapped and tortured. Rumours began circulating that people were finding a number of rodents and stray cats around the neighbourhood that had been tortured and left out in the open. And so this had been strange in itself for the residents, but then specifically for the family. On Christmas Day of that year, Yasuko had told her father-in-law that she had been noticing that the same car had been parked in front of their house on numerous occasions. She had thought it was extremely strange since there had been so many people that were moving out of the area and most of the time people in the area were parking to visit the park behind their house. So if this is where the driver of the car had been intending on going, there would have been much more accessible areas to park rather than outside of her home because doing so would lead them to have to jump over the fence behind the home to get to the park. On December the 27th in 2000, a man had been spotted by a passerby walking around the Miyazawa family home. Initially, it hadn't been a concerning finding because of how close the home was located to the local park, but in hindsight, they considered it strange. The witness had placed the man at being around his 40s, but aside from this, there wasn't really a lot of details known. And then on the 29th of December 2000, a local resident had seen a man at the nearby station located just a few miles away from the Miyazawa family home that they deemed as being odd. This man hadn't been familiar to the witness and he had been dressed in what they described as a skater outfit, which hadn't seemed appropriate at all for the weather at the time. It was believed that this same man had then been spotted buying a sashimi knife in the nearby shopping area on that same day. The following day, a man who had matched this same description had been spotted around a mile away from the Miyazawa's family home. And then December the 30th, 2000 would prove to be a fateful day for the Miyazawa family. They had been preparing themselves for the upcoming New Year celebrations and aside from this, they had seemed to have a relatively normal day. It's believed that at around 6pm that evening, the four Miyazawa family members had headed out to the nearby shopping centre and this was then later supported by a neighbour having driven past their home at around 6.30 and having seen no car in the driveway. At around 7pm, Yasuko had visited her mother next door and had a conversation that appeared to be nothing out of the ordinary. Following this, Nina had headed to her family's home next door to watch a TV programme with her grandmother until around 9.30pm. The next known point in the timeline of the Miyazawa family had been an email read at around 10.40 that evening by Mikio. It was known to have been a work email and that his account was password protected so he would have had to have been the one accessing it at this time. And this had been the last known movement of any of the four members of the Miyazawa family. A witness had placed having heard a loud argument coming from inside their home somewhere between 10 and 11pm that night. They claimed that they didn't hear any other noises but simply put it down to being a couple's heated argument. At around 11.30pm, one of the family members next door to the Miyazawas had heard a loud bang coming from the side of the building that their relatives lived in. And around this same time, a neighbour had recalled spotting a man walking quickly down the path located next to the family's home. Aside from these few things being noticed at the time, the truth behind what occurred inside the family's home would not be discovered for hours. The following morning, on December the 31st, Yasuko's mother had attempted to ring her daughter next door to see if they all wanted to do something together that afternoon, but she discovered that the call wouldn't even go through to the house just next door. As it would turn out, the phone lines to the home had been purposely cut by someone the previous evening, and upon realising that something was wrong with the phones, she had headed round to her daughter's front door and rang the doorbell, but found that there was no answer inside the home. She instead used her set of keys to let herself into the house. As she entered the home, she found that there was no noise suggesting anyone had been inside, but as she walked into the home, she soon discovered Mikio's body at the bottom of the stairs. Mikio Miyazawa had been stabbed multiple times and had been left at the foot of the staircase. Yasuko's mother had decided to walk up the stairs in an attempt to see where her daughter and grandchildren could have been, and just at the top of the stairs, she would discover the remains of her daughter Yasuko and her granddaughter Nina. The pair had been clearly brutally attacked, with it being later discovered that they had been stabbed dozens of times, a vast number more than Mikio had been. And in one of the bedrooms of this floor to the home, she had found the remains of six-year-old Ray, and he had been the only victim him not stabbed, but rather his cause of death had been strangulation. After her extremely upset 
upsetting discovery, Yasuko's mother had immediately contacted the police to report what she had found. This case had been a huge shock, not only to the responding authorities, but also to the general public at the time, since it had been so brutal and distressing. The public were left wondering why someone would attack this family in their own home and who could have been responsible. As the authorities had searched through the crime scene in an attempt to establish what had happened to the family, the relatives who lived next door had started to recount to the officers everything that they could remember from that night. And the main thing that they had said seemed unusual had been the loud thud that they'd heard at around 11.30pm and they were able to remember exactly it being this time specifically because of the TV show that they'd been watching. Initially, police had considered the possibility of this thud having been the theorised confrontation between Mikio and the attackers as the wounds on his body would suggest that he had been in an altercation prior to his death and the thud that they'd heard may have been Mikio being knocked to the bottom of the staircase. And in terms of the wounds found specifically on Mikio, Mikio's remains, the stab wounds had appeared to have been directed mainly at his neck. The knife wounds had matched a sashimi knife that was found to have been left behind in the family's kitchen. And if you recall the sighting that had placed the unusually dressed man having purchased a sashimi knife in a local store that previous day, it seemed as though these were connected and that the killer had brought this knife into the home with him. It initially appeared that following the attacker using the knife to wound Mikio, it had been broken in some way and they believed that the killer had then used a knife that had already been in the family's kitchen to continue to attack Yasuko and Nina. And in terms of the remains of Yasuko and Nina, it was believed that the pair had been in the loft room at the time of the attacker entering the property, watching television together. The loft room was accessed by a ladder on the first floor where the other bedrooms were, and the pair of these remains had been found at the bottom of this ladder. As I said previously, the pair had been brutally attacked and had been stabbed way more times than Mikio had been. Ray, the youngest child, had been the only one to have not been stabbed, and this had initially been quite a confusing point for the investigators to consider, but they had ultimately come up with the theory that he may have been the first in the family to be attacked. It was known that later that same day, an unnamed man placed at being in his 30s would be admitted into a medical centre in a place called Tobuniko, which would be just a train ride away from Setagaya. This man had been admitted into the medical centre, but he'd refused to provide them with his name or just how he came to be injured. Medical staff found that he had a severe hand wound that had been so bad that they could see the bone, but apparently the man had acted strangely calm and rather suspicious by refusing to answer any questions. He was treated and discharged despite his strange behaviour and the medical staff had been entirely unaware of the investigation into the brutal attack on the family in Setagaya at that moment. So back at the murder scene, it appeared as though the investigators already had a lot to work with. Both of the murder weapons had been found at the scene of the crime, both with the blood of the victims still on them. It also discovered the first aid kit that the family kept inside their home had also been opened and it was believed that this had been Yasuko and Nina who had opened it. Authorities had found small traces of blood on some of the bandage strips which would later be tested and confirmed to have been Nina's. When it came to DNA evidence left behind by the killer, they discovered that the assailant had left unflushed feces in the upstairs bathroom. This had been tested and they found evidence of a certain food dish that was likely last eaten by the assailant. The main things found by the investigators that would be potentially useful in the investigation would be would be a number of other items that contained a lot of DNA evidence as well as numerous footprints all around the home in both blood and dirt. As a result of these clear footprints, authorities had determined that the killer had been wearing a specific size of Slazenger brand trainers. And these trainers had been particularly popular in Japan at the time, but it was discovered that the specific shoe size had actually only been available in Korea. They'd also discovered a number of towels and women's sanitary towels dotted around the scene with blood on them, which tests would later determine had not belonged to any of the victims. As a result of this discovery, police had theorised that Mikio may have managed to injure the attacker before his death, which had created a significant wound on the assailant. Authorities had, interestingly, found a number of clothing items that had seemingly been left behind at the murder scene. It seemed as though the killer had not been worried at all about the potential forensic evidence being left behind or that he'd done this intentionally. The clothing found at the scene of the crime had been described as something a skater would wear, including a grey Crusher brand hat, a black Airtech brand jacket, a white and purple long sleeve top, black gloves and a multicoloured scarf and a handkerchief. 
specifically on the shirt had been a number of bloodstains and it was also determined that this shirt in particular had been sold by a specific retail chain that had also sold the gloves and the hat that were found inside the home. One interesting thing to note is that they realised that the handkerchief that had been left behind by the assailant had been ironed prior to being left behind. Many people have since thought this to be an extremely strange finding considering it's not a common occurrence, nor does it seem like something that would be done by someone described as a skater. Something else that's interesting to note is the type of water that was found to have been used to wash the clothes prior to use. Japan had been known for having a soft water system, meaning that there were little to no minerals found in the water aside from a bit of sodium, but the clothes were found to have been washed in hard water, which was another reason for the police to theorise that the attacker may have been from Korea. And in addition to all of this information left behind at the scene, the attacker had also left behind some other belongings. One thing discovered by the authorities had been a small bag and inside had been a piece of grip tape which was typically used on skateboards. They also found trace elements of a specific cologne, the exact same which had been found on the handkerchief once it had been tested. One of the main pieces of information found inside the bag had been sand. Sand can be tested thoroughly in a number of different ways and has the potential to provide a lot of geographical details. It was found that the specific sand found inside the attacker's bag had been from an area in the southwestern United States, specifically in the region of the Edwards Air Force Base located just north of Los Angeles. And this had thrown investigators completely as why would someone who have been from all that way away have committed this brutal attack in Japan one evening. It was theorised that maybe the assailant had been in the Air Force and had been stationed at that time in Tokyo while previously being in the US. It was suggested that the ironed handkerchief may have been an indication of this too, or possibly that he simply worked or travelled in numerous countries in recent months. Months had passed with the police attempting to seek out anyone who had any information relating to the items they found inside the home and potentially the identity of the attacker. There were numerous leads to follow in terms of people reportedly seen to have worn these types of clothes in the past, but once each of these individuals had been tracked down, it became clear to the authorities that all of these clothing items were extremely common. By this point, through the collection of statements from witnesses in the lead up to the incident, authorities had managed to start to piece together a timeline. They theorised that it had been likely that the killer had entered into the home through the bathroom window on the second storey. This window had been on the rear side of the home, just above the fence that separated the property from the park. It would not have been an easy point of entry and they concluded that if this had been the point of entry, the individual would have had to have had a lot of strength to lift themselves up. As I said previously, they had believed that the youngest child, Ray, had been the first person attacked by the killer, likely in his sleep since he was found in his bedroom. They had theorised that Mikio was likely working downstairs as the opened work email had suggested when he then heard a noise coming from the upstairs floors. As he headed upstairs to investigate the noise, he came face to face with the killer and the pair got got into a physical altercation which ended with Mikio hitting the bottom of the staircase, making the thud heard by the relatives next door. They believed that Yusuko and Nina had then been attacked either on the first floor near to the bottom of the ladder or in the loft upstairs. Because of the bandages found in the first aid kit with Nina's blood on them, it was theorised it was during the attack on these two victims that the killer's knife had broken. The pair had scrambled to attempt to bandage up some of their wounds as the killer had seemingly fled before he then returned to their surprise with a knife from their own kitchen. This isn't exactly confirmed as they don't necessarily have a way of knowing for sure what happened inside the home on that evening and many people have proposed other possible timelines but this is just a theory that had been initially suggested by the authorities. But possibly the most unnerving piece of information discovered by the investigators had been that the killer had stayed inside the home for hours after murdering the family. They had found evidence to suggest that he had rested for a while on the sofa in the living room as opposed to fleeing the murder scene. Authorities had also found four wrappers from ice creams that had been removed from the family's freezer and that he'd helped himself to and this concept was confirmed when they found fingerprints on the wrappers that hadn't matched any of the victims. The family's computer had also been used at 1.18am the following morning on December 31st and it appeared that the killer had visited one of the websites that Mikio had previously bookmarked. The website was that of the Shiki Theatre Company and the killer had attempted to seemingly buy tickets to an, a show online. It was considered the possibility that this may have been done intentionally by the killer to give the impression that the family had been alive for some hours after they were actually killed, or that he had just done so in some form of cruel joke. 
The computer was then logged into again at around 10.05 a.m. that morning, where the website that belonged to Interbrand, which was the company that Mikio worked for, had been visited, and so was the website of the school that Yasuko worked at. He had browsed these sites for around 10 minutes before then turning off the computer and unplugging it from the wall. Another strange thing that the attacker had done during his stay in the family's home had been that he had gone around the home and collected all of the credit cards and ID cards that he could find belonging to the family. He'd laid them in the living room near to where he had rested on the sofa and there were a lot of questions really as to why he would have done this. Some people believed that the attacker had attempted to figure out the PIN codes of the cards, possibly linked to his attempted purchase of theatre tickets, and he left them behind after realising he would be at risk if he had continued to attempt to use them once he'd left the home. He'd also filled the family's bathtub of a number of things, mainly rubbish found from around the home, but also some other seemingly important items like receipts from Mikio's work and also some school documents from Yusuko's job. And this is specifically where they found a number of female sanitary towels with the killer's blood on them. It was considered that this had possibly been an attempt at him hiding the evidence or that he had wanted to do something specifically with these items but he had then forgotten, but all in all it didn't really appear as though the assailant was particularly bothered about leaving behind forensic evidence since there was so much of it found at the scene. It was considered that the killer may have stolen some money from the family, suggesting there had also possibly been a robbery motive, but they'd also found a large amount of money readily available in the study in the home where the assailant had spent a bit of time eating ice cream, as the forensic evidence had suggested, and yet he didn't take any of this money, and so it placed doubt on the initial motive being robbery. Over the years, there have been a number of items that have been posted online with people claiming that they have been missing evidence from the crime scene, but the majority of these have either been proven false or the information suggesting these had been pieces of evidence had been misinterpreted. A more recent update occurred in 2006 when the forensic evidence stored from the murder scene could be retested. The blood found in the home that had been confirmed to not match any of the victims had provided a number of key details about the killer's DNA genotype. It was determined that the killer had likely been mixed race and not likely from Japan. One of the parents of the unknown attacker had been Eastern Asian while the other had been Southern European. In addition to this DNA information, they could also revisit the known details about the unknown individual from the original case files to continue to search for the person responsible. The man was believed to have been around 5 foot 7 based on the clothing found inside of the home, as well as having a very specific size of shoe found in Korea and that he had type A blood. One of the main things that appears to divide people in terms of this case had been the belief in the amount of killers that had been responsible for the murder of the family. It was reported reported that a taxi driver had informed authorities that he picked up three passengers not far from the Miyazawa family home around the time of the discovery of the remains. The taxi driver hadn't gotten a name from any of the men and they'd all stayed in pretty much complete silence during the whole trip, but this driver had said he specifically remembered these three passengers because one of them appeared to be bleeding, so much so that he'd left a blood stain on the back seat. He had dropped the men off at a nearby station and hadn't thought to report the strange encounter until he'd heard of the murders at some point later. It's believed that the authorities had in fact attempted to test the blood found in the back seat of this taxi once discovering this report, but it's not really clear if anything came about as a result. And so because of this, many people have taken this as an indication that it was found to not be related or there were no further actions that could have been taken by the authorities. People have theorised the potential connection between Mikio getting into a confrontation with the skaters at the park behind his house not long before the murders, since all of the reports of the clothing found in the home appear to match the type worn by these individuals. But it has also been suggested that this may have been a very clever cover on behalf of the killer. If he had previously been planning these murders and watching the family's movements, he may have chosen to dress himself to match this description. Over the years, there have been many theories, including some which state that former members of the South Korean military were involved because people believe they may have connected these to evidence found at the scene. But as of yet, the killer or killers of the Miyazawa family remain unidentified despite the years of searching by the police. So that is where I'm going to end today's video. And like I said, I really do want to hear your guys' thoughts on this one down below because it really is an awful case and absolutely baffling as to why someone would carry out such a brutal attack. There are so many theories, most of them really don't have any evidence to back them up because there is so much that we don't know. But people have suggested that maybe it may have been something to do with Mikio's work or because of this confrontation with the groups of teenagers at the skate park. There's just not a lot known. But like I said, please do leave your thoughts down below. So thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you found this interesting and I'll see you guys very soon for another video. Thanks for watching.
bye.